Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Deloitte Virtual Perspectives. We're so glad you're here today. I'm Liz Clayman. I'm anchor of the Countdown to the Closing Bell Show on the Fox Business Network, and today we are going to make you smarter. We are going to give you great insights specifically about the M&A world as it pertains to the middle market universe. We have some brilliant panelists coming up, but first I want to introduce you to Roger Nanny. He is vice chair of Deloitte, but you are also the national managing partner of Deloitte Growth Enterprise Services. So explain to people what that is and how it matters to what they're doing in the middle market world. Well, first, thank you, Liz, for being a part of our Virtual Perspectives team. When it comes to the mid-market, the mid-market businesses today are really the unsung heroes of the U.S. economy. They generate the lion's share of job growth and are a significant, if not major, contributor to U.S. GDP. You know, I, I can sense people who are watching and listening saying, that's so true, amen. We are those drivers. But right now, why should they be thinking? Why should they have it in their collective psyche that M&A is something that they should focus on right now? Well, bottom line, M&A is a significant part or can be a significant part of a mid-market business growth strategy. Organic growth is important. Exploring new markets is important. But the M&A opportunity allows a company to really leverage its capabilities into areas that might not otherwise be available. Okay, that, that was a hint. That was a hint to what we're going to do right now. Roger, thank you so much. Let's go meet our panelists so you can get even more insight. Come with me. And here I am. Welcome back to Virtual Perspectives. We're here today and we are focusing, as we just mentioned and promised, on M&A. Seated with me, I'm so glad to introduce Kevin Prokop. He's managing partner and co-founder of Rockbridge Growth Equity, LLC. Reynold Jennings in the middle there, chief strategy officer of Wellstar Health System. And Jack Russey, national managing partner of corporate development for Deloitte LLP. And folks, by the way, we would absolutely love for you to be an active part of this. So feel free to live tweet using the hashtag virtual perspectives. Okay, come join the conversation. Let's go, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Uh, crystal ball time. We know that large cap M&A has grabbed so much of the headlines, but the fact is that it's really the middle market numbers that are a massive driver. And Kevin, I'll start with you because you have done many of these, you've overseen many of these, but why is that the case and why should it matter to people watching right now? Well, I think a confluence of a number of factors, Liz, have really uh, come together and created the perfect storm, so to speak, for middle market M&A. Uh, bank capital is cheap. Um, there's a lot of private equity on the sidelines. Um, corporate uh, corporations have a lot of dollars on the balance sheet. They're looking for growth. They're looking for margin expansion opportunities. And so all those things come together and say um, there's a lot of capital chasing, you know, a limited number of really attractive opportunities. So the middle market is obviously a huge part of corporate America and a huge part of the U.S. economy, but there's just a lot of capital chasing a lot of companies right now. So valuations are very high. Well, if you're going to win in business, You've got to be ready, right, Reynolds? So that means you either have cash or the ability to find people who will loan to you. And then I guess the wherewithal, the fortitude in your stomach to say, OK, I'm going to go for this company and I'm going to snap it up. Mm -hmm. You've been through so many of these in your industry. Uh, what do you think is the atmosphere right now and whether it gets stronger or if we're almost fully valued at this point and the pickings are slim? Well, I'm in healthcare, and that's not only hospitals, but the what we call the continuum of care lives, which is home health care, rehab, physical therapy, behavioral health care. And so I see it from all different facets and angles. And in our particular industry, the forces at foot right now is the fear of being frozen out of the new predicted payment changes that are coming between now and 2019 both at the federal level as well as with private insurance companies. And not only is it the fear factor, but corporate overhead is exploding because of IT technology. And so you need access to that either through another corporate partner or through capital partners to be able to uh, do the things you need to do uh, to meet the IT challenge. Jack, over at Deloitte, when you are, are approached by some of these middle market 
people who are so smart, they're passionate about what they do, they have their expertise, but they want to grow. And they've grown organically to a certain point where they feel now it's time to grow mm -hmm. through acquisition. Mm -hmm. How do you advise them? Well, we, 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 we're looking to acquire them. And what, what, we, what we try to find are great entrepreneurs who have taken their business to a certain level that are really looking for their, their, their kid to grow up and get on a platform where they could really scale. And Deloitte is a really attractive platform for those entrepreneurs. So one of our biggest value propositions as an acquirer is being able to take their vision, use our great resources right. and our capital to help them reach a, a different level that they probably wouldn't be able to reach themselves. Well, you're almost like a guide in that regard. Mm -hmm. How important is it to have sort of a third party? Yeah, very important. I think uh, just to echo what Jack said, I think a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners and management teams at middle market companies think that what got them from where they were to where they are right now are going to be the same things that get them from where they are right now to where they're going. And I think a lot of times people underestimate that it's going to take different capabilities, different skills, different requirements to, to make that next leap. And so I think um, certainly an organization like Deloitte and what Jack is doing and what Reynolds is doing with his acquisitions and what we like to think we're doing at, at Rockbridge can be very helpful in, in bringing something more than just capital to the table to really hope help owner entrepreneurs get to that next stage of their okay. development. You just said owner entrepreneur. Reynolds, in your experience, and by the way, as we've mentioned, the real hot spots as far as sectors are concerned have been healthcare, but you could throw technology, Absolutely. you could throw uh, energy yeah. into that. Energy is so hot right now. I'm sure a lot of you watching are at least part of that. But convincing as a buyer, the seller to come around, mm -hmm. let's first start on that because that's a really nifty but difficult trick, is it not? Absolutely. I mean, even though you hope that all sellers are willing sellers, <laughs> there's usually some other <laughs> conflicting factors that go into their decision about do they really want to sell or not sell? Do they want to sell in totality? Do they, do they want to do a joint venture with you? And so understanding the psychology of the decision makers and the sellers is absolutely critical. Uh, and then uh, following on the last comment, having a third party a group to assist you, and we had Deloitte helping us on the most recent acquisition with Tenant in Atlanta, is my managers are consumed by day-to-day -day operations. So they need somebody who has a worldly view of the boundaries of deal terms and due diligence to help guide and focus your energy level into doing that. Have you, when you do that, Jack, uh, have you at certain points said this isn't the right fit for your company? In fact, that's the number one thing that we try to assess when we when we evaluate a target, right? So you can get into all the financial diligence and the legal diligence and all that, but, but we're a people business. And so if it's not going to be a good cultural fit, you want to explore that very early and you want to be honest about that because some of our biggest mistakes have been ignoring the fact that you, you say, I don't know if this person's going to fit. Yeah. And you were right. They get there, they don't fit. They walk out the door, a lot of the value that you you know, you know thought you were going to buy walk, walks right out the door. Reynolds, yeah. have you ever dealt with that situation? Uh, absolutely. In, in every, every situation, uh, particularly in our business, there's a lot of relationships with physicians, and they have to have that comfort level that they know who the senior leadership is. And so when you make that change, if you don't provide that trust right up front and open and transparent communications, you don't know that the revenues you're looking at in your due diligence are going to be your revenues uh, six months after close. Kevin's yeah. nodding yeah. at Rockbridge. I'm yeah. sure you've dealt with this yeah, before, Yeah, absolutely. And I think we see it conversely as well, which is to say that um, business owners, entrepreneurs, management teams, they're, you know, they come into a process and they're just thinking about the last dollar. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what they underestimate is the art of the M&A process and, and the importance of finding that partner who will um, respect their culture, understand what the organization is trying to achieve, respect where the organization has been, but but also align behind the objectives of where the management team wants to take the business. And, and if you get that wrong, uh, the, the last dollar uh, of purchase price uh, can end up destroying a company. So a, a lot of times in middle market, I, I'm sure you would agree, Jack, that that you're dealing with founders. Yeah. Who That's founded their baby. these companies? It's their baby. It's their baby. Yeah. And and A, they, they think it's worth more than what yeah. the other side wants to pay. Always. Your kids, <laughs> your, yeah, your kids are always smarter, right? They're, They're all the smartest in the world. Golf course yeah. valuation, right. you know, somebody but, pay. Uh. But also, they sometimes uh, aren't quite sure the direction that you, the acquirer, might be 
overtaking the company. So how do you smooth out those rough edges? Is that something that you should put a lot of energy into? We, we do, and I, I don't know if Randall or Kevin, you do this, but we actually have decided to make the M&A process a little less sterile, meaning, and, 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 and elongate it a bit and give the seller an opportunity to, to really see and feel and experience mm -hmm. Deloitte and come to their own conclusion about, is this, is this the right platform? Is this the right culture for me? Is this where I see my baby growing up? Right. And that has, that has yielded big dividends. Well, it's working, because as you see on the screen, 28% of mid-market companies surveyed have completed M&A deals, and I believe a, a significant number, 39% of respondents say it's very likely that they will participate in a merger as an acquirer mm -hmm. in 12 months. So when you look at the culture, Reynolds, that you've dealt with, mm -hmm. where you're picking and, and buying different companies, I mean, how many have you gone through in your career about? Uh, well, uh, as former CEO of Tenant Healthcare, I had 90 hospitals, and you have 20 or 30 kind of going at any point in time over three or four years. Uh, with Wellstar, we're just now buying six new hospitals, five from Tenant and one solo community hospital. And uh, then I've uh, done other joint venture partnerships. So I would say probably about 40 in my career. So what's the number one trick? to making sure the cultures meld when you take on a totally different fabric of a company. Once you get past the founder issues, and by the way, that's an inverse relationship, the smaller the revenue stream, the more time it takes to cultivate the founder. Agreed. So I think we'd all agree with that. <laughs> yeah, but, for sure. but coming back, once you get past that, the founder's always going to turn over the due diligence neg negotiation to both external uh, assistants as well as his internal management team, his, his or her internal management team. And so building that trust level between my team and that particular group of individuals because it moves fast. Sometimes it goes slow and then all of a sudden you have these deadlines and you have to build that trust and transparency that we both understand what the boundaries are between essential deal terms and if we're in that that grouping let's trust each other to find something that's fair for each other. Kevin, discipline on behalf of the buyer yeah. where you set a price yeah. and the valuation has to be right. Where are we right now? in the yeah. valuation cycle. Yeah. Are things getting rich and expensive or there's still some great yeah. deals? Great question. I would say that, uh, you know, by and large, people say that things are priced near perfection for all the reasons we discussed a few minutes ago, confluence of factors. Um, but, but I would say um, to two things. One is there are good companies out there that aren't perfect, but very good companies in great industries with great opportunity that can be bought at reasonable values. No, nothing is mm -hmm. cheap these days, I would say. Um, but, but there are companies out there that can be reasonably priced. Um, what I would say is we try to find the companies where, in the management teams and the entrepreneurs, where price isn't everything, where they're really looking for a partner to help them get to navigate that next stage of their growth, where they're really looking for a partner that can help them take a good company and make it a great company or a great company and make it a world-class company. And so just to build on what Reynolds and, and Jack were speaking to, we spend a lot of time up front trying to understand what are the motivations and values and goals and objectives of the owner entrepreneur and the management team. And I think if you get that right, you've got a lot of the equation. If somebody is saying, hey, I want to uh, build my business and maximize value over the next three years, it probably isn't a great fit for us at Rockbridge. There are hundreds of other private equity firms out there that would do that deal uh, every day of the week. We're looking for entrepreneurs and management teams who are looking to build special businesses, distinctive businesses, great businesses, and we've got the capital and, and the patience and the ability to kind of support them in that journey. And so we're really looking for those op opportunities where we've got aligned objectives and, and, and their prices and everything. Jeff? Yeah, I, I think we're getting a little late in the cycle. I agree with Kevin. I, I believe there's still some good opportunities out there, but you're going to have to be really disciplined Agreed. and not talk yourself into overpaying for things. And I will tell you, my own personal experience back in 08, the two least successful deals that we've done financially closed literally two months before 2008, and we paid premium too much premium valuation and the cycle change so I, what I what I would say is you know be sensitive to where you're at in the cycle you don't need to exit you just need to be sensitive to where you're at in the cycle you know what my dad used to say the only difference between salad and garbage is timing right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's timing Absolutely. and and you don't want to get greedy but right. by the same token you have to be disciplined look Warren Buffett is famed for never overpaying but being reasonable mm -hmm but being reasonable. Well, let's go to now this, the seller side of it, not just the buyers. Uh, and, I, and I think that 
the number one thing, and uh, people watching right now would like to hear this too, even from the other perspective, that the seller should keep in mind, Reynold. Yeah. Well, uh, the seller, and it depends on the, the time frame the seller has in their mind to execute a transaction to do that, that will affect a lot of different decision making. But, but I think, again, once you've got that boundary in your particular mind, you really need to look at the substance of what creates the value of your company going back yeah. to valuation. And, of course, you always start with revenue stability. So if you're an entity that has a lot of contractual relationships that drive your revenue versus retail off-the-street business, is, is you want to be offering yourself uh, to, the, to the buyer at, at a time when your contracts are longer in extension. Because the closer you get to that endpoint, it raises all kinds of valuation questions on what is the value, can you renegotiate these contracts, and those type of things to the buyer. It almost goes to, to due diligence on the other side once again. But Kevin, and, and again, as a private equity guy, you've been through so much of this. Uh, let's say the, you've walked down the aisle, you're married, the, yeah. the, the ring is on the finger, and you're looking at a company now and discovering that perhaps it was the culture, it's not working out as well as it had. Is there a way to turn that around? And I ask you that because yeah. you won the Turnaround Specialist of the <laughs> yeah. Year award. He knows so, what he's talking about. So I'd say if it goes to something as fundamental as culture and values and perspective objectives, there probably isn't a way to turn it around. And best thing to do, as hard as it is at those times, is for either the seller to walk away or the buyer to walk away. Because, I, again, I think if those objectives aren't aligned, it's going to be really difficult to find success. If, on the other hand, the company misses numbers or hits a bump in the road, these are solvable things. And this is, you know, things that we deal with, quite frankly, all the time which is to understand, you know, is this a systemic problem? Is it a seasonal problem? Is it a blip on the radar? And, and figure out ways to go well, through it. Well, it requires work. It, it requires yeah, analysis. Yeah, yeah. Right, Jack? Oh, a a absolutely, absolutely. And I, I don't know if your question was more once they're on the platform, but, but you have to be somewhat, cl um, you know, clinical then, right? Because if it's not working culturally, if it's not fitting, then, then you have to be decisive, move quickly. It, the, the salad doesn't get any better. The longer you wait to the longer you wait to make those tough That's decisions, true. right? And um, I would say, you know, we've done 35 transactions, mm -hmm. almost all with um, owner entrepreneurs, founders, and that integration planning up front is also a great way to test. It is. Do they it get is. it? How, how collaborative is it? How can we take the best of what they do and yep. preserve it because the one thing I always tell the owners is going to be different. It, you're not going to be able to sit around the table with three guys anymore and make all the decisions. Right. You're kind of, Deloitte's a big organization, yep. so you're going to if you can't accept that, don't do this deal. Okay, how do you get that to melt, Reynolds? Well, You've and, done and it many times. Again, in the healthcare field, uh, it, it's all about people. I mean, we even though we like technology and buildings, we deliver healthcare by human beings helping other yeah. human beings. Okay, right? but let, let me throw this at you. Right. You acquire a hospital, you sit down with those proverbial three people or at a hospital, it would be more, yeah. and they say, but we've always done it this way. Right. How do you gently or mm -hmm. not so gently get them to come around to your way? Well, in, in, in today's world, it's not difficult because everybody in healthcare understands changes are afoot and they are accelerating. And again, we don't know the magnitude, but we know somewhere around 2019, the world is going to change pretty severely for us. So rather than using that as a fear, what we try to do is get them on, on board and be proactive with us in helping to know their particular field of expertise. And, and work groups, numerous work groups and senior leaders have to not try and force decisions. They have to let those work groups generate ideas and solutions and then guide them into the arenas where they think the, the best degree of success is doing. And in my experience on this through numerous uh, things over 40 years is that the integration piece is so critical yeah. that Jack mentioned a while ago. But once day one starts, if you want a good new culture, you better make it happen in the first six months. Yeah. If you don't make it happen, you don't get it moving in the right direction, you know, people will get stuck in the old ways, as you just mentioned, and try to go to more protectionism. That's the way we've Kevin, always done Kevin, is it. that leadership? Is that HR? What is that? Yeah, it's. Uh, I think in the end is, uh, not to sound pithy, but it comes down to relationships and trust and, and who are you dealing with on the other end. And, you know, we've got two ears and one mouth, and we like to use them in, in that proportion. Yeah. A and if you've, uh, as a buyer, if somebody says, we've always done it this way, the question is, well, why have you always done it that way? Sometimes there's a very good reason why it's done that way. It may not fit with our mental model, but you got to stop, listen. If there's a good reason, then maybe we should be adjusting our perspective. If, on the other hand, 
the, the reason they've always done it that way is a bit outdated or outmoded or not consistent with where we're going, then you got to work with them to explain why we want to move in this direction. Jack, let's step outside the buyer and the seller and go to the macroeconomic picture right now. I don't know how yeah. many of you saw Janet Yellen, but lately <laughs> she, she looks ready. She mm. looks ready to tighten interest rates. It will be by this much, teeny, teeny mm -hmm. bit, but uh, access to capital for those thinking about effectuating an M&A moment? Uh, I, I think the liquidity is going to still be there. I, I don't think the interest rate move is going to uh, seriously affect that access right now. I do go back to what we were talking about earlier, though. I, I, the valuation environment is, is, is pretty frothy, right? So you can have access to capital, but you may you want to be very disciplined. You may want to preserve that capital in case you have, um, you know, the the natural down cycle will allow you to actually deploy that with better return. Reynolds, have, have you had a rule in the past where where you you borrow to acquire, you you do a mix, or you keep your powder dry in the form of a pile of cash? Well, having the strongest balance sheet possible in today's world is like goal number one. Uh, because again, even if you go out and borrow money to make an acquisition, you typically have to fund the working capital for the first two months out of your current resources. Mm -hmm. And if you can't maintain, in our particular case, our board wants a, between an A and double A, a credit worthiness standard uh, because that affects your interest rate and long-term borrowing costs sure. and access to capital and things along that particular line. And, and so again, yeah, keeping that balance sheet, and we work for four years to get our balance sheet to a point that we were able to take advantage of these opportunities when they occurred. When you buy a house, you, you throw all your money at the down payment, but you better have enough to pay the next couple of months of yeah, mortgages yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and any problems that may arise, yep. right? Yep, no, no, no question about it. And again, I think that Is there this, a rule that you follow with all of yours? Th there isn't, other than, uh, you know, our objective at Rockbridge is not to eke out the last quarter turn of leverage. And, and we always kind of say to ourselves, if you're pressing leverage, you know, you're paying too much or the business isn't one that we should be buying. We're looking to create value and build great businesses through organic growth. And, and we're buying growing businesses and good industries. And so the returns ought to be there. If you can pay a reasonable price and, and put some modest amount of leverage on it, the return should be there. And, and it's a sniff test for us if we're feeling pressure to increase leverage. Not only do we uh, get concerned about problems coming down the road, but it's often kind of an acid test that uh, this isn't the right business keep, for keep us. Keep tweeting us, by the way, folks. Hashtag virtual perspectives. Join this conversation. You wanted to say something here, Jeff? No, I was going to say, we're lucky. We're, we're, we've just been a cash buyer, mm -hmm. you know, so we haven't had to rely on debt. We could, mm -hmm. but... Um, Actually, having the discipline to do it out of cash has been really, really effective. And to your point, having that strong balance sheet at the right time. Right time again, yeah. some of our best deals were down cycle. Right. Nobody else could borrow. We had the cash on the balance sheet. We could go, we could go acquire. As we continue this conversation, we're, we're speaking to the, the for-profit, the profit companies. But I think, Reynold, we may have some not-for-profit uh, organizations. Well, Wellstar, my, my entity, is not-for-profit, yes. Exactly. Right, so is there any difference, any shade of gray to be following that's slightly different? Well, in, in our case, again, uh, access to the tax-exempt bond market is critical for us to acquire uh, new joint ventures, bring in new technology. And, and so again, in that arena, we may use conventional financing for bridge financing for a year till we can do a tax exempt financing. And so, as I said earlier before, uh, having your balance sheet metrics in correct order are critical to having uh, people who want to buy your bonds when you go to market. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. uh, and people suddenly get that splash of cold water and shock anytime you go to the market, whether it's for profit or not for profit. How can people watching right now avoid that? It's so important, I think, to learn not just from your own mistakes, but from the mistakes of others. Can you think of any anecdotal situation where people could learn from that type of misstep? Yeah, I think, you know, again, just going back to the last cycle, the last downturn in 2007, 2008. Um, those that were kind of looking to maximize value had dollars on the table today and took the maximum amount of leverage that they could at the highest price. Ultimately, those, if you rolled equity, you were a middle market owner, entrepreneur, or manager who rolled equity into a deal like that, uh, you had tough go. Yeah. And not only did you have a tough go, and some of those businesses were lost along the way, but um, th those that uh, weren't lost along the way lost uh, a lot of opportunity. 
And so I keep coming back to, you know, you got to have the long-term perspective here. It isn't all about cash on the barrel head today. It's about, is this a partner who's going to help me get to, to the next uh, stage of my development? Do we have a shared perspective on where we're going? Do we share the same values? And is this uh, somebody ultimately that I'm comfortable? And, and how about, it, does it fit in the grand puzzle a piece that I'm missing? You don't want to double up. You don't want to, in many cases, sort of, uh, I guess, ladder on something that you already have a lot of. Yeah, I mean, w w one of the things that we've learned has probably been um, uh, the most effective tool is we, we don't chase revenue growth. We, we chase positioning, strategic mm -hmm. positioning. Right. So it all starts with the strategy of the business. Okay, that's important. You do not cha chase the revenue yeah. growth, but more the, and then it will follow, correct? If you go with the strategic We, we, we believe that's an outcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. We do. We believe, <laughs> we, we believe that's an outcome. And, and as partners though, we're, 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 we're lucky we're not a public company. So we only, we only eat with profits yeah. and we only eat with cash flow. And so what we're, we're focused on EBITDA, we're focused on repositioning through acquisition in, in new, high growth, high profit spaces. Yeah. yeah. Right. Reynolds, looking at, at the world, which is littered with M&A that, that didn't quite work out, mm -hmm. you're a real shining example of a success story on, on many cases. Well, thank you. <laughs> Go back to your best one you ever did and why it worked so well. Well, I'm hoping the one I'm about to do right now is going to be the best one. Yeah. Uh, my, my current employer would appreciate that, you know, you know very much. But, but again, I think uh, if I were to go back, the, 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 one, the outright acquisitions where you know the culture and you, you, all the things we've been talking about, the culture is a fit, uh, those are not really the challenges. It's really the joint venture acquisition opportunities to where you're either going to be a minority like 40, 49% or into the 51% you know, to where finding the right mixture of bringing in their leadership and whether you can do it or help them out of those kind of things is the one. And, and uh, I, I really, uh, because of the uh, confidentiality rules I have with some of those companies, I can't mention some of those, those type of things uh, from that standpoint. But, but your, your whole demeanor is happy, so I'm assuming you had good, <laughs> good success Absolutely, with all of yeah. that. Um, as, as you look, Jack, at the overall picture going forward, can you spin it forward about six months, and I hate doing that because it's so short term, mm -hmm. but six months to a year, is it still a fertile and rich environment for people watching who are considering m and I, I, I think it is. Again, we've said it a bunch of times in this, in this conversation. If you're disciplined, if you're looking for the long term, yeah. if, you're, if you're focused on value, yeah. and, and, and you're consistent with your strategy, I, I, I think it is. I think the sectors, Healthcare, a lot of things going on in healthcare. Obviously, en energy again being disrupted. You didn't mention marketing, marketing services, the customer. There's a lot of things going on in space. I know you guys are Absolutely. active in it. We are too. So I, I think there's sectors that are going to be really active, and there'll be good deals to be done there. Where do you see it all going? Yeah, I agree. I, you know, it, it does feel like we're a bit off the top in terms of valuations, so maybe you know, approaching the later stage in a cycle. But, but I absolutely agree with what Jack said. Is uh, in any part of the cycle, there are going to be great opportunities, and and so maybe six months from now, eighteen months from now, thirty-six months from now, volume is down. But if um, you're doing the right deals for the right reasons, um, good deals will get done, uh, both as buyer and a seller. You need certain characteristics to run a company, to found a company, to sell a company, and to buy a company. I'm thinking courage works with all of them, <laughs> Reynold. Is that a characteristic? And, and is there anything else from a business standpoint that people need to either have or learn quickly? Well, can courage should come from conviction and conviction should be driven by facts mm -hmm. and and yes uh, <laughs> knowledge and due diligence <laughs> folks. Yeah. so so again there's always this ebb and flow in a due diligence period and even in the integration management side you know to where some executive has got to step up and take charge and show the courage that we decided to go on this path we knew the data was right to stay on the path and even though surprises is going to come up, you know, we've got to stay focused and do that. And, and again, having at least one senior manager who's got that courage to rally both the buyer and the seller forces in that is absolutely critical to finally getting day one accomplished. Is that what you've seen, Jack, when, when there is that moment where you do have to take that plunge, that you've got to back it up with several different aspects. You've got to have the knowledge and the facts, mm -hmm. but you also have that courage and the leadership. Yeah, so every single one of our transactions because 
it's the partner's money. Yeah. And so I come to work with all my shareholders every <coughs> single day and the, the level of of um, governance over our transactions is is pretty intense, mm -hmm. so I, I would get nowhere if I didn't have all, all, all the facts, because <laughs> I got a lot of smart partners, and they'll undress you if you don't have the facts. So, they yeah. sure will. And, and Kevin, as we finish up, what's the one thing that you feel is the best part of acquiring a company or merging with a company? Uh, for, for us, uh, the opportunity to work with talented, energetic um, entrepreneurs who are looking to achieve great things, that is inspirational. People who are looking to build great businesses or world-class businesses, and they, um, they excite you by virtue of their passion and what they're trying to build, and to be a part of that, a small part of that, as their partner is um, a great way to show up to work every day. Well, I think that you have shed some great light and insight into the, that world, that mm -hmm. universe of M&A right now for the middle market. I want to thank all of you, Kevin Rockbridge, Reynolds Jennings, and of course, Jack Rissa. He's so pleasure to have you. all of you, you and our much. and our extreme thanks to Deloitte yes. Virtual Perspectives. We hope that you've gleaned so much. We're so appreciative for you being here and check out hashtag virtual perspectives for more. See you next time.